Hello, welcome to this presentation. It's great to see a full room here and a massive thank you to the organizers for holding yet another one of these, which I always very much enjoy. Uh, so today I'll be talking about predicting residential occupancy and hot water usage from high frequency multi-vector utilities data. Uh, the way we'll, I'll go through this, um, I'll actually try and use the 20 minutes because I've got a lot to cover. So if you do have questions, just come uh, afterwards to ask at lunch. Uh, but the way we'll go through it is I'll do a quick introduction as to what uh, the client, myself, the company I work for and why we were doing this work. I'll then go into the specifics of what this, act, this project actually is. And then I'll give a bit of uh, a few graphs and quite interesting numbers to show you uh, sort of taking the more, the more interesting snippets out of the project. So the work we did was for the Te Energy Technologies Institute. Uh, those of you in the UK may have heard of this, but it's uh, the simple story is it's a 400 million UK uh, body, which is combining industry and the government with the view of helping us reach a low carbon future. And uh, Andrew Haslett was very much the visionary behind this work, which a few of you have also probably come across in these conferences. And I'm actually very grateful to him for coming up with the idea and uh, the opportunity to work on this. So we delivered this work over a good part of last year. I was a project manager on it. So it's one of many projects I would be delivering at any one point, but I was uh, accompanied by a great team from ASI and Beringa Partners. Uh, ASI is a partner of the company I work for, and we worked very closely with their CEO amongst others on developing this technology or helping, or helping prove this, uh, what we'll, we'll show in a second, and Beringa Partners, which is where I work, which is a management consultancy of around 600 people that focuses, around half of those people focus on energy with maybe sort of 40 or 50 quite technical quantity type profiles. And then just a few words on myself, I joined Beringa three years ago to set up their data science team and currently run the Modeling and Machine uh, Learning Center of Excellence. So before I dive into exactly the problem we're trying to fix, I just want to give a bit of context on the future energy system. Um, so at the moment, the, everyone's probably heard about, you know, global warming and all the potential consequences of this. And actually, if you start looking into it, it can be quite scary. Um, and so on one side, we have a growing need to provide energy to more and more people as there's population growth, but you also have GDP growth, which generally correlates quite heavily with energy growth. So we have increasing energy demands across the system, but on one side, but we have an increasing awareness and evidence that there is global warming and high carbon emissions. So we need to meet this in a way that's not detrimental to future generations. Now there's many enablers to get there. Uh, the sort of typical or a typical way of breaking this up is technology, regulation, and economics. So you could just simply say, no more, you know, we're not going to generate any more energy in ways that has carbon emissions. Or, but that would be quite, quite a strong uh, stance. You can do it through economics. So pricing signals, for instance, in the energy system will be key. And you can do it through technology. And there's been a lot of technology that has come out in the recent years that's been very helpful. So solar's massively picked up, wind as generation technology is massively picked up, storage is picking up, and there's quite a few things. Now, specifically in this project, we're going to look at one, which is demand side efficiency uh, for residential properties. So residential properties are obviously a huge use, use a huge amount of energy, and they're one of the big energy demands on the system. And within that, around 80%, at least in a European level, is used for heating. So that's either space or water. And it's probably fair to say that a lot of that heating is done in an inefficient way or an unnecessary way. So I'll know many people that, and that might include myself, that will leave the heating running when they're not home, for example. So that's a perfect wet place to improve the system. And similarly, as this issue becomes more and more pronounced of the future energy systems, what you'll probably see is flexible pricing throughout the day. So pricing today would, you know, you might get an energy bill based on what you consumed in the last year, but it will be insensitive to at what time you consume that, whilst that might not be the case in the future. So if we see that change, which I personally expect we will, then there will be a huge benefit from shifting when you consume your energy. So if we can understand, this was the problem posed, if we can understand or predict when people need to heat their water or their property, could we, 
we could basically shift consumption in order to be more optimal in terms of when it's used or simply reduce consumption. So there's two benefits there to make it more uh, energy consumption more cost effective. So the, the exam question here is, can we predict when someone comes home essentially and therefore needs the heating or when they're going to use hot water uh, using machine learning and specifically quite relevant to the NIL community, high frequency multi-vector data. And the way we broke this down is we built 10 machine learning models, uh, one or five for hot water, five for heating, space heating, and we, they were over five different time horizons, those models. So one was to predict 10 minutes into the future, one was an hour, another was four hours, another was 24 hours, and another was 72. In terms of how we did or how we structured that problem, so we, we were given high frequency electricity data for a property, and that's 200,000 hertz, but you get one data point for voltage and two for current, so it's actually 600,000 data points a second, which was three terabytes per property per month, so quite a lot of data. Uh, and we had water um, and humidity at sort of every few minutes level. So a lot less high frequency. So we had to bring that all together using ETL, but also data feature extraction so that we could sync it up in a nice manner. Um, we then, so, and that's quite a normal machine learning approach that we then did a clustering on the electrical state. So we ran a clustering that basically told us what property, what state of property was on. So for a given property, we looked at, you had 25 states or clusters of the property. So this is slightly different to NILM in that we're not trying to see what devices are on or off, but what combinations of devices are on or off. So it might be that they have, they're doing that, say a breakfast routine, which has a few things on in the kitchen, or it might be that they're in the living room with a certain combination of lights and TV on or echo or whatever it is, but it's not specifically saying what those devices are because that's not ultimately what we're trying to predict here. And from this sort of nice data table, we could run our predictions. Uh, and we ran random forests with a lot of additional feature extraction sitting in the middle um, to build two predictive models. So on the right hand side, you've got hot water usage. And on the left side, hand side, you've got occupancy. Now, one really key point to make is we weren't given the label of occupancy or hot water usage. So we had, it was a sort of semi-supervised problem. So we had to essentially label that. On the occupancy side, that was a lot harder because basically, um, or I start on the other side, on the hot water side, it was quite easy because we had water flow and water temperature. So we could infer when the boiler had kicked off um, and we could therefore come up with quite an accurate proxy. But for occupancy, it was a bit more tricky. So we had to essentially guess when the people were there, but we had other sensors in there that would help us work it out. So humidity, for example, is a very clear indicator if that goes up that someone's home. Um, but it was a bit of a manual exercise. So essentially we had a few people label a property and we compared their opinions and they were actually pretty consistent and we built a little app for them to basically do that. So now into the more sort of juicy technical bits of this. Um, one key question here was, we were given high frequency data and you know is that actually useful because we can actually see energy consumption at a much lower frequency so do we need to go high frequency and there's a few things you actually see that are quite interesting on this graph so the way to look at this graph is you go from left to right and on the left hand side i mean sorry left to right where you have five you can imagine five thousand vertical lines each line is a fourier transform and that basically extracts the level of energy you're seeing at each frequency. So at 50 Hertz, you see a horizontal line, which means that across those 5,000 Fourier transforms, there's always seems to be a fair bit of energy at 50 Hertz. And then you've got another one at 100, 150, 200, 250, et cetera. Now, what that is, is that electricity comes in at 50 Hertz in the UK, and therefore you have a natural level of energy coming into a home at 50 Hertz but you see quite clear, let's say, ripples as you go up to 100, 150, and so on. And so from this, it appears that a lot of information is actually stored at the multiples of 50 hertz, as opposed to just sort of randomly throughout that space. And you get actually more 
seems like you get more energy at 150 hertz than at 100. So the odd multiples seem to store more. Now, there's lots of electrical engineering things behind this, which I don't, I can't admit I fully understand myself. But essentially, what you see is you want to store the information at the multiples of 50 hertz. And, as, and the other thing you see is you have the vertical lines. And those vertical lines are probably what you could call a switching event. So that might be someone turning a light on or off. And so what we did at this stage is we said, well, we've got to get this data to a more manageable size. We've got three terabytes per property per month. We need to downsample this. And a logical way is to essentially do peak finding so the, and store the amount of energy at each of these harmonics. So uh, what we did is we took the 600,000 data points and we stored from zero to 200,000 Hertz, two data points for each 50 Hertz multiple. One was active power and the other was reactive power. So we had got just now a compression of 75. So that makes this already a bit more manageable. But the next thing we did is we said, let's, let's do a further dimensionality reduction. So we tried a few different algorithms. So you had say, we used UMAP, which was a nonlinear algorithm. Um, it works, it's decent, but it's a lot more computationally intensive. So we took a step back and went to an iterative version of PCA. Uh, which is nice because you can parallelize it. And what you see is that the first principal component actually has 97% of the information. So this is a, a principal component analysis on 4,000 active power numbers and 4,000 reactive power numbers, which are the multiples, for, or, you know, which is the active power at 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 150, 200, et cetera. Um, and so the first principal component actually has 97% of the information, and the second one has virtually 3%. So you can say, actually, we don't need anything else because we can reconstruct most of the curve from two principal components. However, we're not trying to reconstruct that curve. We're trying to understand whether there's valuable information in some of, the few, some of that space. So we kept 50 principal components because you're essentially looking for potentially for a needle in a haystack. You're not going to say, I can get most of the haystack, but leave the needle out. Uh, and then what's interesting is having done this analysis, we found that the first three principal components in our data set were actually significant. And so the first one is mainly, if you really look at what it's composed of, it's mainly active power at 50 hertz. The second one's mainly reactive power. And the third one is the third and fifth harmonics, both active and reactive power. So there's actually a lot of, it seems to be actually quite good information in the high frequency information. So it's not just about power consumption. Uh, and at this point, we've basically done a 75 times compression and then going from, we went from 8,000 data points per second to 50, which were the 50 principal components. So you've got a significant reduction in the data size, which makes it more manageable. So if you look at say the standards question, for me, uh, it looks like if there's a lot of things you could do and you would potentially just run uh, a Fourier transform on the chip itself, for example, which can be done with cheap hardware and send back potentially, say, those 50 harmonics. That's one way you could go about productionizing this uh, in a cheap way. So having done all that analysis, the next thing we did, uh, I mean, having basically downsampled it to the 50 principal components for electricity, which is our main vector, we get one data point, I mean, we get 50 data points a second. What we then did is we said, what's actually going on in that property? So we did a, we ran a clustering algorithm on it. Here it's hierarchical DB scan. Again, easy to use because it's parallelizable. And we found that this specific property was in one of 25 states, basically 90% of the time. And this is quite interesting because what you can then do is you can zoom into each state and look at how the property jumps between states. So if you imagine a normal individual, you might, for instance, every Monday wake up, uh, have a shower, have breakfast, and then leave the house. And if you see certain trends in people's behaviors, you can then predict what they're going to do next. And it's, in this case, slightly different to your typical NILM use case where you're trying to understand exactly which appliances are on. Here, you're trying to see roughly what state the property's in. So the blobs you get might be making breakfast 
where it's slightly different combinations of making breakfast. Uh, and when you start zooming into the use of those, of those clusters over time, you actually see there's some interesting patterns. So that's what we did. And there were sort of three clusters that seemed to be autonomous. And by autonomous, what we mean is they can appear pretty much at any point in the day, and they pretty much do. So unless someone was home 24 seven, then those are basically autonomous clusters. So they just are scattered throughout. And then there's certain clusters that appear at certain times of the day. So it might be, they always appear for 20 minutes at 6 p.m. on a weekday, but never at any other stage. Now, some of those you could argue are, uh, you know, an automatic, you know, uh, basically a gardening thing that's gonna, you're gonna have something in the garden that goes on or a light or something of the sort. But in this specific case, we looked at they weren't consistently exactly 6 p.m. It might be 6 p.m. one day and 6, 6 10 the next day and then 5.50 the next. And essentially, if you see one of those, you know someone has come home. And the reason this was significant is because we also didn't have an occupancy label. So if we've seen someone's come home and done one of these, has activated one of these clusters, we know someone got home that night, probably went to sleep, and then they did their morning routine. So we could label this quite nicely in that sense. So the clusters weren't very predictive because you've got the information in the principal components, but they're useful for interpreting the human behaviors. And so to bring that all to essentially a close, um, what we've done is we, we pulled all that, we did the electrical, uh, high, well, basically we did the, we ran Fourier transforms on the electrical data to downsample it somewhat. We then ran the principal components, and then we put both the principal components and the clusters into this. And we used the clusters to label the occupancy. We did some similar work on the water side, but a lot less complex. Um, and we used humidity as well, and we combined all of that to build a predictive model. The results we got um, are based on a model that does not disaggregate appliances. So that's something that would actually be quite interesting to layer in and see what added value that would have, but it specifically didn't in this case. Uh, and doing all of that, what we, um, what we found is high frequency data is valuable. This is a small data set, or it's not a small data set, it's a small sample size. So that's worth bearing in mind, but the initial results basically suggest high frequency data is valuable. It suggests non-electrical data is valuable. Um, something our client was quite insistent on and I think it's a very actually important point, is that priors are very powerful. So obviously people's behaviors are consistent, you know, from every Monday to Monday type thing. So given that people's behaviors are quite consistent, priors are actually key as well in this whole analysis. And the reason I, that's also important is a lot of the time this data has quality issues. And so if you have downtime on the device, a very natural fallback would be to go to your prior. So if you don't know what's going on, you can use a prior to decide what your strategy is. And then um, the other thing is I haven't spoken about it in the feature engineering, but essentially memory is obviously very important. So if you want to predict whether someone's going to use hot water, it's not about looking at exactly what they're doing now. It's as much about looking 24 hours back and saying whether they've used hot water in that period or how much they've used. So we did a lot of feature engineering on the memory side. Um, so that's essentially summarized the results. You can see the results in the table, but uh, it's, quite, it's quite hard to measure without going into very specific examples. But essentially that's the area under the curve. And so if it's 50%, it means it's not doing very well. If it's above 50%, it's doing better than average, better than random. And if it's 100%, it's doing excellently. Uh, I can talk through some more specific numbers uh, in person, but essentially that it, it, it's an interesting use case. I think the technology essentially works. I can see it working in the future. I can see electric vehicles doing something very similar and being quite a good use case. And I think a really important consideration is these data volumes are very big. So in a production environment, running something like a Fourier transform before transmitting the data back to a headquarter of an energy supplier or the DCC is going to be incredibly important. Thank you.